Hello guys, welcome to this second ever episode of Book Insights. I'm Tom Butler-Bowden. Each week we do a deep dive into a non-fiction bestseller. Might be self-help or psychology or business or philosophy. Could be a recent hit or an ancient classic. But each book we cover can improve your life or your work in some way or just make you think. If you're mainly into motivation or self-improvement, I'll try to widen your references and expand your mind a bit. Or if you're more into highbrow stuff, I'll highlight some amazing books for success you might not know about. So today's book insight, Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker. You might know Pinker from his 2012 book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. In that one, he argued that violence and war were on the decline and humans were becoming a more peaceful species. Enlightenment Now is sort of the sequel to it. By enlightenment, Pinker's not referring to a kind of Eckhart Tolle spiritual state, but the intellectual and philosophical movement that dominated Europe during the 17th to 19th centuries. The enlightenment was about the scientific revolution, the idea of progress, and humanism. Pinker is obviously a massive fan of the enlightenment, In his mind, everything that's good about our world today comes from it. He puts forward reams of examples and data to show that, thanks to science and reason, we're healthier, wealthier, and more educated than ever before. Whenever we've gone against Enlightenment ideals, for instance, fallen for isms like fanaticism or racism or nationalism, it's always ended badly. Pinker points to massive risks before us today, such as climate change or nuclear war or societal breakdown. These things can reverse our hard-won progress if we're not careful. So this idea that we'll only continue to improve if we stay on the path of reason, science and facts, it's also the argument of Danish statistician Hans Rosling in his book Factfulness, which you also might know and which we're going to cover in Book Insights. It's also the worldview of people like Bill and Melinda Gates, whose foundation is trying to stamp out the major world diseases through science and better sanitation. Basically, the idea is let the facts lead. Pinker's book does have its critics, and we address some of that in the book Insight. So do keep listening through to the end. But overall, I think this is an important book, and Pinker writes beautifully, so it's a delight to read as well. Please do support the podcast by liking, subscribing, or sharing today's episode. Or just post a comment. We'd love to know what you think. And by the way, you don't have to wait each week for the new Book Insight to be released. You can have constant, unlimited access to over 100 Book Insights at memo.com slash insights. You'll see the link posted on the podcast description. But let's dive now into the main ideas in Enlightenment Now. Hope you'll enjoy it. No matter who you ask, the general consensus seems to be that the world is worse off than it was in the past. On top of that, the foreseeable future doesn't look much brighter. In conversation and in the news, you're unlikely to hear much that's positive about the world. Discord and conflict reign supreme. Prejudices are on the rise, as are terrorism and nationalism. Society is becoming polarised. The question is, are we falling off into an abyss? Or are we just unable to appreciate progress? In almost every demographic across the world, people's outlook is pessimistic. But on the other hand, people are demonstrably and statistically getting happier, healthier and wealthier. In short, we think that things are getting worse, when in fact they're getting better. This tension and how it has arisen is at the crux of enlightenment now. The subtitle of Stephen Pinker's 2018 bestseller is The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism and Progress. It traces our progress back to the ideals of the Enlightenment that began to emerge in 18th century Europe and looks at where we stand now. In many ways, the book is a follow-up to Pinker's 2011 book The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. In this, Pinker also assessed the current state of the world from a position of optimism. In Enlightenment Now, Pinker carries out a statistical analysis of human flourishing. He argues that it's the values of reason, science and humanism that emerged during the Enlightenment 
that have been the main cause of the general betterment of humanity. But the progress that began with the Enlightenment is not inevitable or irreversible. Almost immediately after philosophers like Denis Diderot, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Immanuel Kant began to extol the virtues of reason, science and humanism, the counter-enlightenment pushed back. Major figures of the counter-enlightenment, including Edmund Burke, who saw the progress of the French Revolution as a disaster that ruined the traditional values of France's Ancien Régime, Friedrich Nietzsche would also argue against the Enlightenment, seeing its rosy rationality as dangerous. And the Romantic movement also pilloried the earnest rationalism of the mostly French Enlightenment philosophers. Yet Pinker contends that whatever the cultural or artistic merits of the counter-Enlightenment, it is only Enlightenment values that have driven the world forward. Moreover, he argues that this tension between Enlightenment and counter-Enlightenment continues to this day. For progress to continue, Enlightenment must ultimately emerge victorious, and it must be newly recharged for the 21st century. Born in Canada in 1954, Pinker earned his PhD in experimental psychology at Harvard in 1979. He went on to teach at MIT and Stanford. Much of his research has been focused on psycholinguistics. He's currently a professor of psychology at Harvard. In this book, Insight, we'll explore the following four topics that Pinker covers to support his argument. First, the advent of reason and science. Second, the case for humanism. Third, progress. How far have we come? And fourth, continuing the push. What's next for our progress? We'll conclude by taking a wider look at the context around Pinker and Enlightenment now, as well as addressing any potential criticisms. Often known as the Age of Reason, the Enlightenment was born out of a search for a rational explanation of the world. As Renaissance science and technology began to mature in the early modern world, traditional theories no longer satisfied. Many emerging thinkers had newfound knowledge that contradicted the long-standing belief systems based on religion. They argued for the authority of reason. The world, for better or for worse, was in the current state because of the actions of its inhabitants, not as a result of some nebulous outside force. For the same reason, it could also be changed by humans. Armed with the knowledge that reason could be applied towards their search for solutions, people began to use science to study human nature. They started to gain an understanding of humans grounded for the first time in early forms of neuroscience, biology and psychology. While rationalism provided the impetus for improvement and science the means, the values of the Enlightenment couldn't be considered complete without an ultimate goal. Science and reason were necessary conditions for change, but unlike religion, they didn't provide anything to aim for. But Enlightenment thinkers did eventually unite around a single goal that would fuel and steer the age of reason and scientific inquiry. Humanism. Humanism is a philosophical and ethical position that emphasizes the agency and inherent value of human beings. Here is Pinker himself speaking at the Oslo Freedom Forum in New York. The third Enlightenment theme is humanism. The, that the ultimate moral purpose is to reduce the suffering and enhance the flourishing of men, women, and children. That is, their life, health, happiness, knowledge, richness of experience. This applies to the individual and collectively. Its proponents are driven by a notion of human freedom and progress. Historically, humanists have seen traditional beliefs and values as holding us back from fulfilling our potential. Pinker asserts, that only science and reason can deliver the paradise that religionists mistakenly claimed would result from spiritual faith. The 18th century Enlightenment thinkers' drive towards humanism has had a number of effects that continue to shape the world today. Humanism is against all forms of coercion, dominance and violence. Enlightenment humanism deplores war. War can only be justified in the implausible circumstances that the needs of the perpetrators outweigh the harmed individuals on both sides of the conflict. It prohibits slavery, as the complete suffering of the slave can be in no way balanced against any resulting improvement in the slaver's life. There are also the key principles of utilitarianism, 
which was pioneered by English philosopher Jeremy Bentham concurrently with the Enlightenment in the 18th century. The practical effect of humanism is a deontological moral philosophy. Deontology, from the Greek deon, meaning goal or obligation, is based on the belief that an action should be judged by a set of previously established rules. Deontology is also often known as rule-based ethics. The combination of utilitarianism and deontology means that humanism essentially boils down to doing the most possible good for the most possible people. But it also recognizes that humans are valuable in and of themselves and shouldn't be treated as a means to an end. No person is expendable. In the centuries since the Enlightenment began, the world has improved in many ways. Though some of these improvements are contestable and subjective, others are not. Certain aspects of progress can be measured objectively. Being healthy is better than being sick. Being at peace is better than living in a war zone. And being safe is better than being in danger. Being literate, educated and having opportunities is better than being illiterate, uneducated and impeded. Being happy is better than being sad. These criteria are not exhaustive, but they form a basis, agreed on by most, of a definition of human flourishing. And, as we'll see, these things have universally improved throughout the world, in both the richest and the poorest countries, since the Enlightenment began. These principles, when properly applied, have led to the greatest increases in human progress since the beginning of recorded history. Perhaps the most quantifiable measure of progress is the average length of human life. Even taking into account factors such as overpopulation and tyrants who wreak terror, it's hard to argue with the following. Once a person is born, their quality of life is better when they're alive than when they're dead. To be alive is the necessary precondition for health, peace and happiness. Without being alive, any other indicator of progress is redundant. In this part, we began our dive into Harvard professor, psychologist and author Stephen Pinker's bestseller, Enlightenment Now. We learned about the Enlightenment, or the Age of Reason. Pinker explains that our progress over the past 300 years is due to the ideals set out by Enlightenment thinkers in the 18th century. These ideals look to science, reason and humanism for the answers to the big questions that life throws up. In the next section, we'll go into the statistics that Pinker presents on the dramatic increase in human lifespan and its resultant benefits. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. Wherever you live in the world, it often feels impossible to avoid the headlines declaring that we're doomed. But are we really heading towards an abyss? Or have we forgotten how to acknowledge progress? With galvanizing optimism, in his best-selling book Enlightenment Now, psychologist Steven Pinker argues that we are happier, wealthier, and healthier than ever before. We just need to look at the statistics for proof. In this part, we'll look at human progress. Just how far have we come? Prior to the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution, human life expectancy at birth hovered between 30 and 40 years. This was true in pre-modern hunter-gatherer societies, ancient Rome, the Tang Dynasty, Golden Age Baghdad, Renaissance Florence, and early modern London. For all of the rising and falling of states, the lifespan of a vast majority of people stayed the same for thousands of years. In the middle of the 19th century, however, there came a sudden improvement. The application of science to the problem of disease and death began to bear fruit. Vast improvements in sanitation meant lifespans began to skyrocket. But the increase was unevenly distributed. Europe reached an average lifespan of 50 in the early 19th century, while Africa took almost another half century to reach that same figure. While lifespan growth was inequitably shared, it had no exceptions. 
By the end of World War II, every single part of the world had exceeded the approximately 40-year average lifespan that had previously been a constant for millennia. The average person born today can expect to live almost 80 years. For a person born in 1700, it was 35, and that's if they survived infanthood. In the 1700s, child mortality before the age of 5 was close to 50%. It's now less than 5% worldwide. Infant mortality in the poorest countries in the world today is lower than it was anywhere in the world a mere 50 years ago. This progress is almost entirely due to scientific advance. Maternal care, infant care, germ theory, advances in nutrition, and a host of advances in medical science, all of which have allowed humanity to rise above what had previously been an insurmountable problem. What must have seemed to be an inevitable part of human life has nearly disappeared. Pinker says, despite its inequalities, the rise of human life expectancy has been perhaps the most dramatic change of the modern era. Here is Jim Broad interviewing Pinker on WGBH News. But it's not just the absence of bad news. You think there's a ton of progress, a ton of good news as well. There, there is progress uh, that you can find if you look at global data, if you look at the percentage of kids that are going to school, if you look at the percentage of girls that are going to school, if you look at rates of uh, homicide, if you look at rates of death and warfare, uh, if you look at rates of uh, extreme poverty, all of them are going in the, uh, in the right direction. Yet simply being alive isn't enough to prove that the state of the world has improved. If humans lived longer, but lived in constant states of suffering, the increased life expectancy brought about by science would be for nothing. But disease and suffering have been massively reduced, Pinker says. Though by no means defeated, disease as a cause of suffering and unavoidable or unexpected death is less common now than it has ever been. Throughout history, millions of people, both rich and poor, have been struck by infectious diseases that are now either largely contained or entirely eradicated. In the 20th century, over 300 million people died of smallpox. Today, over 40 years have passed since the last case of smallpox. And this is just one example. Pinker estimates that over 5 billion lives have been saved solely through the work of 100 individuals who did the most to eradicate disease. In many cases, those diseases resulted in slow, painful deaths, and they're now largely a thing of the past. The minimization of deadly illness as a cause of death is the result of Enlightenment science. But the Enlightenment's supremacy of rationality and knowledge plays a part too, Pinker points out. It's not just vaccination and medicine that have made an impact. The spread of ideas like proper hygiene, equality, and education for all have had vastly positive effects. Rates of world hunger have followed a similar path to disease. Prior to the 19th century, any given year likely saw more deaths from famine than any years in the 20th century. This includes the famines in the Soviet Union, China after World War II, and across the Horn of Africa and Yemen today. Further, unlike modern famines, in times past there was often little to no relief effort available to reduce suffering. Scientific advances such as the agricultural green revolution and humanitarian efforts, have changed the way that famine is seen. Previously, it was either brushed off as intractable and inevitable, or exploited by political machinations. Famine, though still too prevalent, is now seen as a problem that can and should be solved. We are closer to a solution than ever before. Wealth is at a similar high point in world history. The worst off people in the poorest countries in the world today have purchasing power that allows them to exceed the standard of living held by close to 99% of the global population 200 years ago. Most of the planet has access to medical care and advances that aristocrats in the 18th century could only have dreamed of. However, progress in the growth of wealth has been more inequitable than in other areas. Average wealth has been multiplied by nearly 10 in some countries in the past 100 years, while other countries have seen only a fraction of this growth. But Pinker points out that even in the most impoverished countries, material welfare is increasing at a steady rate. Enlightenment rationalism states that knowledge is important, and Enlightenment humanism says that this knowledge should be held by all. Right now, both of these ideals are being put into place more consistently than at any other time in history. 
In some countries, the provision of basic education and the achievement of basic literacy are problems that have essentially been solved. In Western Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, the amount of people who haven't received any education is almost zero. Whereas 150 years ago, almost a third of the population in these places would have lacked the educational levels we take for granted today. Literacy and education rates in even the poorest parts of the world are higher now than they were in the richest parts of the world prior to the Enlightenment. A person in South Sudan or Afghanistan today is more likely to be able to read and to receive a basic education than your average Dutch person in the late 18th century. Moreover, with two exceptions, the world has reached gender parity in literacy. This would have seemed preposterous to many only 30 years ago, when only two-thirds of girls were taught to read worldwide. Today, with the exception of Pakistan and India, the literacy gap between males and females is statistically insignificant. And despite setbacks, the trend is improving in these two countries. The gap is decreasing every year. In this part, we continued our exploration into Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now. Pinker contends that the problems that we currently face, problems that could cause existential oblivion and end human flourishing forever, can be answered by the Enlightenment ideals. Thanks to science and reason, we, as humans, are healthier and more educated than ever before. Next time, we'll conclude our book Insight by looking ahead and asking, what's next for our progress? Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're wrapping up our deep dive into Enlightenment Now, the case for reason, science, humanism, and progress by Harvard professor and psychologist Stephen Pinker. For Pinker, humankind's ability to overcome nuclear threat, the rise in prejudice, global warming, extremism, and terrorism lies in our ability to forge a newly rejuvenated enlightenment for the 21st century. In this part, we're asking the question, what's next for our progress? We'll have a brief recap of the lessons, then conclude with a consideration of Pinker's legacy. The universal progress in health, material wealth, and education are not the only examples of the progress instigated by the Enlightenment. More people live in democratic societies than ever before. People are less likely than ever to die violent deaths. This is true despite the recent increase in terrorism, which Pinker contends has been given an overstated importance on a global scale. Despite apocalyptic fears, terrorism at its peak caused 30 times fewer deaths than are currently caused by motor vehicle accidents each year. Fears that the world could end in catastrophe are as old as time. Some imagined ends, such as religious apocalypse or the fears that emerged around the Y2K bug, are mostly unfounded and misguided. Others, such as the threat of climate change or chemical, biological and nuclear warfare, are very real. Pinker argues that Enlightenment focus on reason, science and humanism must be applied in the effort to reduce and eliminate these threats. The first step is to reach an understanding of the problem. People must use reason to separate the true existential threats from other, less essential worries and fears. This isn't to say that other problems aren't real, but those issues that threaten continued progress must be elevated above all else. All progress is good, but if issues that threaten progress itself are not resolved, any other improvements will be for nothing. Pinker's point is that progress is not a foregone conclusion. Failures happen despite the positive trends, and a reversal is not impossible. Scientific analysis must be applied to the search for solutions. Once identified, a problem must be broken down into its fundamental parts. It must be understood on the basis of objective data and information. Any attempt at resolving the problem must be made on these findings using evidence-based approaches. In short, separating ideology and beliefs from fact-based solutions is the key to progress now, as it always has been. 
Most importantly, this approach must be aimed towards a humanistic goal. A true existential threat is one that threatens all of humanity. As such, its ideal solution must be one that benefits humanity as a whole, not just a particular group within it. Here is Pinker himself in an interview on WGBH News. I, I wanted a, uh, a rubric to cover values of reason and science and humanism and ultimately progress. And uh, I dated them to the Enlightenment of the second half of the 18th century, uh, including the American founders and framers. Mm -hmm. But the idea that by using reason and uh, sympathy for, uh, for our, our fellow humans, we can make progress. We can figure out how the world works. We can... Uh, implement institutions and reforms that make things better a bit at a time. As of right now, Enlightenment principles are being used to vastly reduce the very real risk that the world will be destroyed by nuclear war. The number of nuclear weapons in the world escalated immediately after World War II, before peaking in the middle of the 1980s. Presently, levels are at less than a third of their peak, close to the number that existed in 1956. Further reduction is absolutely necessary. The dismantling of a large portion of the world's nuclear stockpile, Pinker says, would be one of the greatest proofs for the success of Enlightenment ideals. Yet preventing global obliteration requires constant, active humanism. The current trend of nuclear arms reduction is being bucked by the stockpiling of weapons by India and Pakistan. Though each side rationally understands that any attack will harm the aggressor on the same level as the target, the tensions between each country ensures that the potential for destruction still exists. There is still enough nuclear weapons in the world to destroy it several times over. But a humanistic focus on the safety of the world as a whole can increase the chance both that the weapons will not be used and that their reduction will continue. If the values of the Enlightenment are nurtured and continue to grow, the threat of all-out nuclear war will continue to decrease. Pinker argues that if Enlightenment ideals fall out of favour, existential threats may increase in probability. If a catastrophe occurs, all of the progress in human life expectancy, health, education, safety and happiness could be reversed in the blink of an eye. Whether the threat is nuclear war, climate change or political extremism, the solution is the same. The problem must be recognised, understood and solved with the ultimate goal of improving the state of the world for all of its inhabitants. Let's have a quick recap of what we've covered. First, we learned how the advent of reason and science changed the world. The Enlightenment did away with the trappings of religion and tradition to show us what real progress was possible. Second, we saw how Enlightenment thinkers and scientists needed a single cause for their efforts. That cause was humanism which is about humanity advancing through reason rather than belief. There's also a moral dimension to humanism. We try to lift up all people, not just particular groups or communities. Third, we looked at some of Steven Pinker's measures of progress. In the areas of lifespan, health, wealth and education, we've made massive strides. But it only happened thanks to the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment idea of progress. Fourth, we asked how we can continue the push forward. If we stay on our current path, it's clear that humanity can continue to get richer, healthier and more educated in a more equitable way. But there are also massive risks, such as from climate change or nuclear war, that can reverse all the progress if we're not careful. Despite the improvements that he cites, the message that Pinker offers is one of cautious optimism. If people continue to aim at progress through the use of reason, science and humanism, the world will continue to become a better place for all of its inhabitants. But if people adopt racist, sexist or populist nationalist ideologies, our progress can be reversed or wiped out. The world is getting safer, healthier and richer, but there will always be a possibility of a complete reversal of human progress thanks to culture, religion or politics. Pinker has been criticised for cherry-picking parts of his argument, and Enlightenment Now can at times come across as unbalanced. Hans Rosling's book, Factfulness, also takes a statistic-based optimistic view of the world. But where Rosling encourages us to embrace the facts that don't fit with our worldview, because that's exactly how we learn and grow, 
Pinker tends to gloss over any ideas or facts that might contradict his case. For example, the philosopher David Hume is notably absent in Pinker's discussion around the 18th century Enlightenment, even though he was arguably one of its greatest figures. Hume famously wrote that reason is the slave of the passions, which might account for his omission in the book. Pinker is at pains to establish the Enlightenment as an age of straightforward logic and moral reasonableness. Yet, as the philosopher John Gray has pointed out, Pinker's presentation of the Enlightenment seems to be completely free of evil. The fact is, tyrants like Stalin repeatedly appealed to Enlightenment ideals of progress when enacting mass human extermination. Finally, many have also questioned Pinker's insistence that we're getting happier as a society. You don't have to look far to find statistics that counter this. Depression and anxiety have risen unquestionably in the past decade. These criticisms aside, enlightenment now is in no way a manifesto of contentment. Pinker doesn't ask his readers to decide that the world is good enough just as it is, or that progress will take care of itself. He fully admits that the world continues to face countless serious problems. The number of people living in poverty is enormous when compared to the amount of wealth that exists in the world. Too many continue to die from diseases that could be prevented by basic medical care. And too many die in wars over issues that could be resolved through non-violent methods. Gender, racial and sexual inequality are still rife. And in some areas are getting worse. The Sultan of Brunei's 2019 move to punish homosexual sex with death by stoning is just one of many examples. But these problems in no way invalidate the central point of enlightenment now. Yes, the world is plagued by preventable inequality, discrimination and death. But Pinker's case is that the history of the world shows us that rational application of science aimed at the improvement of humanity as a whole can succeed. We can live longer, happier lives. We can be healthier, wealthier and wiser. We can reduce the impact of war, racism, sexism, fascism and extremism. The facts show that we have achieved astonishing progress. But it will only continue if we stay on the path of reason, science and facts. We can't take any of it for granted, as we could easily return to a new Dark Ages. Enlightenment thinking got us to where we are now, but its flame must stay lit. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.